Please, everyone, uh, the email template that you're going to paste in the Word doc, just paste it after the email, the, the last email template. Yeah, and a, and a big thanks to uh, Harsh for coordinating a lot of the stuff in the background and, and you, Spencer, of course, as well. Um, you know, you guys have a, a history of doing these really well. And, and I think it's easy for us to jump on and then jump off and, and move into the next thing in our busy lives. But, um, you know, hopefully there's a lot of people that are going to walk away today better off in, in where they were in their career or in their in their own business themselves. So super excited to be uh, to be doing this with everybody. And, and yeah, drop those templates in, as Harsh was mentioning. That's awesome. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. We'll go one by one. Uh, I might have questions for some if, if, if I need a little bit more input on what we are you know, trying to do with this specific one, but I'll keep a lot of it pretty general so that uh, it helps everybody. So here we go. And if anybody has questions, please put up in the chat section. Uh, Matt is going to bring, bring them up uh, while Spencer works on those templates. All right, guys. So we've got the first one up here. We have a subject. Can I work for you? And what I'm going to do, guys, is first I'm going to go through the template that I, that we have. I'm going to beat it up a little bit, and then I'm going to rework it and give information on that. And and Matt, of course, feel free to chime in as well as we're going through this. So subject, can I work for you? Hey, John or Doc. Uh, I'm assuming it's John or the doctor, but I'm not sure. Just saw that people are saying positive things about your business and thought I'd reach out for help. I'm currently studying the chiropractic niche to help them bring new patients so they don't have to guess where new business is coming from. Uh, and so would you be open to an intro? I'm happy to buy coffee or lunch for your time. Paulson, PS, I truly think I can I can help you bring old patients back and attract some new patients with my strategy. Sent from my, my iPhone, I'm assuming this create for authenticity is probably just a note about it. So I'm gonna get rid of that. Okay, so, you know, first thing, uh, can I work for you? When you have a subject that you know, makes sort of the uh, the recipient think that it's something maybe for them. I'm okay with that because it gets a high open rate as long as we tie it to what we're putting in the messaging, right? It can't be something completely unrelated. In this case, it does, right? Can I work for you? They might think you're actually looking for a position with them, which causes them to open it, but you clearly, you know, delineate that that's not what you're talking about in the messaging, but it ties to that. All right, so just saw that people are saying positive things about your business and thought I'd reach out for help. This is my opinion that something like that maybe would have worked two, three years ago. But when you have something like that, that's completely generic, number one, it's fluff. And so you're wasting bandwidth with that person might read that sentence. And that may be the only sentence they read and they stop. And two, uh, there's, you know, as far as that goes, there's, there's not any real information in there. And so I know that when you're saying that you don't really know me. So you've also given that up. And then, of course, as I mentioned, they may not get past that sentence. So third is you're not adding any value. So the first thing I would do is I would remove this this sentence okay then we go into i'm currently studying the chiropractic niche to help them bring new patients so they don't have to guess where new business is coming from now this is again where the dynamic has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years to get in front of people you know it used to be about social proof and all those things now those things are still important but to me less important in that first or second email and what it's all about is them and so right off when you start talking about i i'm currently studying the chiropractic niche Okay, you might hold on to them for a second because they want to help a fellow chiropractor is what, what they might be thinking. So I can see that potentially. But outside of that, you're basing this on me and not them, right? And so you really want to go into that right away. So I'm currently studying the chiropractic to help them bring new patients so they don't have to guess where new business is coming from. So instead, you know, we could say something along the lines of, you know, hey, John or, or, or Doc, I'm still not sure I quite understand that, but that's okay. We'll move on from that. Yeah, Harsh just dropped a comment there, guys, as well. But as you see these messages being typed out on the screen, if you guys want to drop some some questions pertinent to this specific copy, or um, if this was your suggestion or your your template, rather, um, jump in and you can clarify things like the Hey John or Doc, if that's supposed to mean doctor or, or something else. Okay, so the next thing that we're doing with this is, if so, I currently have three right now that might be a good fit for your practice. Why are we saying that? If we just say, hey, we can get you new business, everybody says that. Everybody else says I can get you higher, more revenue, more efficiency. But if I say I have three right now, all of a sudden that's going to you know, potentially make you perk up 
because if I don't get back to you, I may lose the three that you have right now to begin that conversation. All right. The next thing, would you be open to an intro? You want to be a little bit more decisive with your words here. So instead of would, you know, you want to make sure that when you're, when you are emailing people, yes, you're asking for their time, but at the same time, you should respect your time just as much. And, and so when you use words like would or those type of things, you lose a little bit of that authority. Um, so. Yep. That's, that's really good, Spencer. I'd be happy to do an intro. Okay. And then we go into. To confirm they are the right fit for your practice. What is your availability to connect tomorrow? And I usually don't say tomorrow, but in this case, we can create a little urgency because we've got these three right for them right now. The other thing is I'm happy to buy lunch or coffee for your time. So at the end of the day, most people for $5 or $10 or $15 are not going to do a meeting with you if unless you know they think it's really a fit. So here's the thing. That doesn't add anything in this case. In fact, it deters from your main value prop. So I'd remove that. P.S. I truly I can help you bring old patients and attract some new patients with my strategy. This is a completely different value prop. So this is something that we would leave for a second or a third email because each one we want to tell a different story. I meant to put what is your availability? As far as sent from your iPhone, you know I can. I, I've never done enough studies on that to know if that works well, you know, better or not. But the way you know you can look at that is I don't know how much that really means. It just, in fact, it might mean that you just wrote this off the cuff, so they think it's, it's not from an automation. Sure, you can try that. Um, but overall, guys, here's how I would craft that email. So happy to answer. Are there any questions in the queue about this one, Matt or Harsh? I'll just pull it up here real quick. Before I move into the next one. No, uh, Bonnie did, did specify the Hey Doc. Um, and then somebody just popped in with, uh, would you, what would be a better subject line in your opinion? I think can I work for you is actually a pretty good subject line because again, I don't ever want to bait and switch somebody, but if you can have something where it's going to get a good open rate because they may be thinking one thing, but it does tie to what you put in your message, then I'm okay with that. And I think that's probably a pretty good subject line based on that. The thing you want to think about with subject lines is would number one, would you open it? Right. And of course, of course, everybody's is different Two, Does it look like something that is, is spam or something you want to ignore? And you start to look at those things and that's how you think about it. All right, let's move to the next one, an API to automate identity verification. Okay. Congrats on your raise. Been a while since we last connected when I was at blah, blah, blah. And you were at blah, blah, blah. So I'm assuming we've got merge fields for those time flies. Um, and I'm, and, and I'm assuming that might be, you know, something where you're using like an AI icebreaker type of tool. Uh, I'll let that person answer that as well. Is any is anyone on your team building identity verification to into? I would again assume your company this year. Burbex is an API to uh, layer IDVT into your product. Feel free to give us a try. Demo link. I've worked with the product managers and engineers at blah blah blah. The folks that integrate our API. I see a lot of parallels, and I think there's an opportunity to discover if we have a strategic overlap. If you're open to grabbing a call, I'll also appreciate any redirect to whoever owns customer vacation, if that makes more sense, thanks in advance and have a great day. All right, first off, um, and guys, please, you know, don't take this with a you know, grain of salt. I, I want to make sure we help everybody. So this isn't to pick on anyone, but this to make sure that we're writing the best types of messages. This is a mouthful, guys. Like this is so much to, to assume that somebody that's never heard of you that may not even know what type of product you have or if they need it to read all of this, long shot, right? And the biggest thing that I see is a lot of times people think, well, if I get them enough information, something there will get them. No, you, that's why you have multiple sequence, you know, multiple you know, emails in a sequence because each one tells a different story, but you can't just throw it all in one. Not only does it sort of uh, dilute the, the messaging of the different parts of here that are, are unique or important, but they're not going to get through this all. All right. So as far as this goes, um, again, guys, I'm going to assume this is an icebreaker. You know, one thing that I'll say is, you know, since you connected at this and that, if you actually did connect, that's great. As far as congrats on your raise, that by itself, kind of generic. That being said, if I read congrats on my raise, especially with something that was three months ago, six months ago, nine months ago, I mean, maybe you get them the week after, but most of the time it's just going to be like, 
I know I don't know you because no one's going to like write me like that. They might, you know, say something to me on, you know, in Facebook or, or, you know, a quick like text message or something, but not here. So it's already to me a red flag that I don't know you. So the first thing I would do is get rid of that for the time being, I'm going to leave this assuming if again, you guys did connect then that's good. Cause you, you know, the, as far as that goes, they'll say, we know that person that gets you through the door. Okay. Is anyone on your team building identity here, identity verification into uh, again, I'm assuming the company name this year. Now I don't love this, but if you are going to go with something like this, that should literally be the end of your email. And I don't want to go into this one a little deeper, so I will make it so it, it, it isn't in this case, but that should be it because you want to have one major call to action in every message. When you start to have more than one, what happens? You don't get any of them answered or whatever that call to action is. You've got one here. You've got another one to try our demo link here. You have a third one to talk about redirect whoever does handle this here. It's too much, right? Okay. And so I would sort of look at it as this might be your question in assuming who you're reaching out to, if that job title knows what you assume they know what that is, then stop there. All right. If that's not the case, um, <clears throat> then we might change it and do something a little bit different. Now, again, I'm not sure if the goal here is to get them to a demo link. That's what it sounds like. Or ultimately, if you really like to get them on a call and I missed it, there's actually a fourth call to action here, open a grab, hang a call that I, that I missed. There's so many. So again, we, can't try to push them to a demo and to a call too much. And the other thing is usually on a cold email, I don't recommend trying to push somebody to a demo. If they're not familiar with A, who you are, B, what your product is, or C, if they even need it, that's a really far push to push them to that. On top of that, you no longer control that situation and that sales process. If they go there, you have no clue what they need. You haven't been able to qualify. And then, you know, you could be done before they even sign up for that link. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. The other thing is in terms of like saying what you guys are, again, it's not about you. It's about how you can help them. You should have in your signature some basic information such as, uh, you know, your, your name, your job title, a link to your LinkedIn or company. So if they want to find that information, you can, you, they can get that very easily. In fact, you can track that in most systems as well to know that they did that, but you don't want to give them that story here. Okay. So first we've given them a reason of why we should be talking because they already know us, right? So, all right, we've kept it going. I've worked with the product managers and engineers. So again, this is about giving social proof, but overall right now, so we're, we're kind of a far away from social proof. We just need to get them intrigued. Social proof is something as, you know, maybe if it was like, you know, I work with Apple, et cetera. Okay, that might be interesting. Most of the time right now, it's just, we want to get them interested. And I know you're saying we see a lot of perils and they think there's an opportunity to discover if we have a strategic overlap, if you're opening or grabbing a call. All right, so an API to automate identity verification. So I don't know this space well enough off the top of my head, but here's what the direction I would tell you you'd want to go. What are some of the things that can happen in terms of negative things if you don't have an API to automate identity verification? What are some of the ways that specific industries might need to be able to use this, you know, if you're, tar if you're segmenting based on a specific uh, vertical? That's how you want to start to think about this, right? So for example, you know, there's different companies, whether it's in finance or whatever it is, where they need to verify that. And having that, you know, to a high degree is really important. It could either put them at risk uh, or it could be somebody, uh, you know, that is not that person trying to sell a service or product that's not their own, whatever it might be. All right. So again, we want to have one call to action. And at the end of the day, would you love them to like schedule a call with you out of the gate? Sure. But just because you want that doesn't mean that's what they want. I give this analogy a lot, but I still think it, I think it's always important to hear for those of you I haven't spoken to in the past is when you're on a first date with somebody, if that date starts and you go in for the kiss in that first second, pretty awkward. They're going to be like, what? Hey, hang on. You know, we just met. If it was a good date, you went to, you know, had you had dinner, you went to the movies, you know, good rapport, good conversation. And three hours later, you go in for a good night kiss, probably going to be received pretty well. Well, my analogy here is asking for a meeting most times. I, I think it, it worked in this first one because we created so much urgency, but in other ones where it's just, hey, we want you to check out this app, we really want to start a dialogue because it's very off-putting for people and a bigger commitment than they might be willing to do. And then you lose them uh, right out of the gate. So we really should be starting a dialogue instead of going right in for that meeting. Um, doesn't mean we can't get on the second caller pretty quickly thereafter. But so in fact, you know, time flies, you know, curious, um, how is your app? And then you might even put like, you know, and I'm making this up because I don't know the space. Uh, 
you know, especially based on the recent blah, blah, blah update of something that may have caused why you need this even more or the recent right. um, somebody that, that got a big company that may have had an issue because of this, right? You know, and that's it. That's your question. All right. And so you get rid of this. Thanks in advance. Have a great day. Don't need any of that. All right. Any questions on this one before we move? Oh, also the subject. Let's go to that. An API to automate identity verification. I, I don't know that I'd open that. Also, I do like to like put in little things like I'll put lowercase uh, letters in sometimes. So that seems more personal or informal, um, but might do something. But especially if we last connected and you know this person in this case. Yeah. So so they did clarify and they, and they asked here in the comments, uh, would a loss aversion subject line be better here? And, and yeah, I like what you did there, Spencer, too. Like the thoughts that are coming to mind for me um really is kind of that sincerity we, we want this to be especially where it's like been a while since we last connected um but you're kind of leading with like almost like a headline type of subject line um yeah so there, there just seems to be a little bit of a misalignment there so um yeah like remember when we met at xyz like if that's if that's genuine um keep in mind like if, if i were to open this personally get through that first line been a while since we last connected when i was at x and you were at x time flies if we had barely met each other in passing and like I found your business card, but I didn't remember who you were and you said time flies, I'd be like, no, it doesn't, man. Like we don't even know who each other are. Right. Like that's what would go through my head. And I'd be like, next, because I got 16 more emails that say my company X, somebody else's company that I'm ignoring today as well. Um, and it, it's kind of one of those things where if you give people even the slightest inkling of, of doubt that this is a sincere interaction, they'll just leave in the email inbox more than anywhere else. Um, so it's one of those places that if you don't lead with that authenticity first, you're shooting yourself in the foot and the rest of the copy, the offer could be awesome. Um, but yeah, like, like, like Spencer led with that uh, subject line of, of, you know, we met at XYZ. If that's true, that's awesome. And double down on that. Yeah. Um, Cause really, you're, you're trying to build out that relationship. But if it, if it kind of is like, yeah, well, did we meet? Did we not meet? Like I saw you on stage, but we didn't meet. Like that's, you know, that's not going to be well received, even if your offer and the rest of the copy is good. Um, so just be really sensitive with that stuff, guys. Because like Spencer was saying three years ago, probably like stuff like that would have slid a lot easier. Um, but now because there's so many people adopting cold email strategies, um, that, that bullshit sniffer is like on max. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, good point. Anything that's fluff, you know, basically the other thing too, whenever you write these emails, people always talk about make them as short as possible. I agree with that. Now, super short, just for the fact of being short doesn't help. You want to get whatever that specific message is that you're trying to convey and then make that as short as possible to where it still has that information there. All right, let's go to the next one. Trash your business cards. 80% of your prospects do within one week. Instead, create a powerful impression with MTAP, a digital business card platform. Okay, I know who this is. Um, Julie Bonasante, okay. So you create a powerful first impression. Spencer, I'm gonna let you stew on that and I'm gonna answer a question here in the chat yeah, while please. you think on this one. So mm -hmm. um, Alana asked, what's a good subject line for outbound when you do not know them? Um, it really, It really depends on the context. Like you have to be attention grabbing but again, like you have to keep in mind those those car salesman type of lines and, and pitches um, aren't generally well received. So while there's not a shortcut answer I can give you, um, often if you're talking to a specific niche, they're not thinking about themselves as being in a niche. They're in their own echo chamber. They're thinking about this is their whole life. This is what everybody around them knows. So you don't want to talk to their niche. You want to talk to them as a peer. And so that's where you can start to go down the rabbit hole of, of their social life, what's, what's relevant to the industry in, in amongst their colleagues at the break room. Like, and that's where you can find stuff that if you can take that type of context and put it into a subject line that you're going to get attention. So like in the API example, if you know, there was a, um, like a big case that everybody in your space knew about recently, where there was like a big data breach of something or like a big failure of that technology. Um, and it's like, it's now there's new compliance concerns or whatever. Like if you can talk to those very specific things in a non- Hey, I saw a news headline type of way, um, then that will get your foot in the door. But, but again, I use the example all the time of the, the relevance of, of how you bring your pitch in. You have to be present. You have to kind of be part of that conversation and take that disposition, not just somebody like shouting into a crowd, trying to sell them popcorn. Like you got to really try and be part of that scene. 
to have a subject line that that leads with authenticity. So um, I don't know if that gives you any clarity or not, but hopefully that kind of gets your mind working on different strategies you could develop. Um, sorry, I went on a tangent here, but go for it. No, Spencer. great. Okay, so let's look at this one. Trash your business cards, 8% of your prospects do within one week. Instead, create a powerful first impression with MTAP, a digital business card platform. Okay, so this is short, but we're missing a bunch of things here. Number one, there's no call to action. Okay, so you wanna have a call to action. Every, every single message should be guiding them somewhere whatever that is. And this one's not doing that. Number two, we say 80% of your prospects trash their business cards, but we haven't given them of why is that an issue, right? Like what does that lead to? Uh, and so instead of create a powerful impression, we don't also have any clue like what MTAP is essentially doing. It just says a, a digital business card platform. So we've got to give a little bit more here. Um, I mean, as far as trash your business cards, I mean, it's an interesting subject, but at the same time, I feel like I know that I don't know the person that's sending it to me because it's just, it wouldn't, it, it, it's it, it wouldn't hit me as something that hey this is what somebody I, I know would say like why would they tell me to trash my business cards right <laughs> so right there like we could start off a little bit something with okay so something that talks about what we're looking at here hey do you still have have your have my business card and let's not skip the colon after the first name. No, nobody you know or trust oh, sends an email. I, I, I didn't see that. Yeah, good catch. All right. So first name, you know, do you have my... <laughs> I like the personality guy. A business card. Something I, that came to mind, guys, earlier um, when we were talking about the API solution for identity verification, um, and it ties right into this one as well, is there's always two sales that you have to make. And the first one is really just the idea of what your business even does in the first place before they even consider if you're the right person. When Spencer was talking about social proof and saying like, it's too early for social proof, unless you're going to throw like Apple and Amazon at them, nobody's going to really care about your social proof. Cause we all know people work with Apple and Amazon or with these other smaller companies, but it's not really selling anything first. So the first idea that you kind of need to convey to these people is, is what Spencer's doing here, which is saying like, Hey, uh, business cards are clearly not as effective as they were 20 years ago. Like that's, that's what the, iteration of that message is up there. Um, it's just to say that, hey, this old technology, this old solution is is not the best. And, and now that you believe that, now MTAP and all of our competitors matter to you. Here's why I'm the one reaching out to you in the first place. I'm the right person for you to be talking about this with and considering a new solution that's going to help you grow or XYZ. Um, so that's, that's kind of the frame to think within. You, you got to sell them often first on the concept of what your product business offers at all. And then you have to sell yourself and the product that you're selling. Um, so that's the toughest part. We all, we're all part of our own businesses. And so we've bought into our own philosophies. We, we clearly, you know, pour our heart and soul into these as business owners or as, as, you know, key employees. Um, so it's really easy to forget that other people don't believe in what you do. Uh, that's kind of like, oh, what do you mean they don't believe in what I do? It's like, well, they don't care. There's a million companies out there and they have to first figure out why what you're even doing is relevant to them and, and something that is valuable to them to invest energy in for them to get to that next step and say, now I actually am considering your product. That's actually the second part in that intro on the cold email that first part is really all about selling your your concept or solution uh when it's truly truly cold if it's a little bit warmer of an intro then you get a shortcut
Good point. And so you guys may have seen as, as Matt was going through that, I deleted some of what I had, right? Because that's a big thing too. get rid of anything that you have that doesn't add to your main uh, messaging. And so, you know, what we were doing here is, hey, I would guess not mainly because I never sent you one, but I'm assuming if you're like me, you give out several dozen, if not more at conferences and other events, then it gets thrown away and connection lost. So you're talking, okay, you're giving a little bit of context here, but very quickly, I have something that will help you convert 80% more of these follow-ups into post-conference meetings. Now you're giving something of the real value. What, what is actually going to happen by having these connections lost? I'm losing those meetings here. I could gain more. And then are you currently using physical business cards? Now, again, this is opening a dialogue. Now, if we feel like that most people are not, but they still will find our, you know, this application useful. It just means you'll have a second or third or fourth message, uh, you know, that will will give a, a different, a little bit of a different, you know, question or call to action. But in this case, if we're trying to replace some, you know, physical business cards, then I think that's a a really important question to ask right out of the gate. And I think a lot of people will respond to that either with a yes or a no, um, and then that starts the dialogue going. You know, because if they say no, well, how are you? That that can lead to the follow up. Well, you know, how are you? you know, getting names and, and, and taking them down at events. Or if they say yes, you know, how many of these are you giving away events, et cetera. Uh, but that's where we want to make sure, again, we have these different, uh, at least this specific call to action, et cetera. So any questions on this one before we, uh, we move on? Uh, not specific to this, Bonnie David has said, uh, I'm starting from scratch. For me, I can't include social proof in the beginning. Um, and just to clarify, Bonnie, you don't need to have social proof in your cold emails. Um, but at some point, they're going to look for some form of it. And there are ways in the beginning that you can get social proof that aren't um, that aren't made up, they aren't fake, but um, they're less conventional. Um, so, you know, we could have a separate conversation or a separate, you know, rabbit hole discussion about that. But for the sake of this, we'll stay focused. All right, I'm gonna skip this one just for a minute because I know we already, I think probably had one from this person, but we'll come back. I wanna just make sure we hit as many people as possible. Okay, how Audi checks driver's license. Hey, first name, Audi uses driver license, driver license checks to stop joy rides and provide, and this says Burbex again, so it might all be the same person because um, we keep talking about Burbex. So I'm gonna go down one more time. I just wanna make sure we give everybody a chance on here. If not, we'll go back. All right, looks like they're all there. So you know what, we'll start right from here. And again, guys, keep adding if, if you want to get your message on here for us to go through. All right. So I'm ready to start a conversation about current IDV vendor on FIDO. Product managers using on FIDO. I'm working with face difficulty, probably just a typo, with data accuracy. Specifically, their users often require multiple verification attempts or had information parse incorrectly leading to costly manual ID reviews. In a recent head-to-head, Burbix -head, IDV demonstrated all of these things. After reviewing this information, is it worth reassessing your customer identity experience? All right. Without a lot of context, as I'm a little confused on this one, but what I'm going to at least do is pinpoint some things here right out of the gate. Number one, we don't want to use bold almost ever. That is like a huge like red flag that this is probably from someone I, I don't know. Number two, very sparingly do you want to use, if ever, bullet points. Again, something really common done five, six years ago, uh, four years ago, and not only do you know the systems like Google pick up a lot of times that these are, are you know cold messages that hurt with your deliverability, but people see this and I'm done. I'm not reading. All right, I'm a little confused at like what if, if, if like we're giving them a password to log into something here. So uh, so I'm not sure. In fact, I'm probably not going to rewrite this one, but I'll give just a couple other more details. I'm ready to start a conversation about like again like that giving that sort of pretext already sets me up that like you don't know me and we're just already starting off with like this is what i'm writing about there's just no additional value with that um so yeah this one i'm a little confused so i'm, I'm not gonna rip up matt any any sort of additional thoughts on this one before i move to the next um i'll just clarify there's six employees from burbex here somebody said in the comments so these Got are different employees that they're using um but yeah, just just as you said, Spencer, um, really, and, and I keep hearing you say something that's kind of creating a theme for me, which is this is telling people that that you don't know them. Um, and your email inbox is, is generally an intimate space. It's where your banking updates come. It's where your your notifications that you don't want come to and you've turned off. And so you're kind of you generally have a good idea of what you expect in your inbox. 
And so when there's somebody in there that doesn't belong, it stands out. Um, and so that's really the first step is to, obviously you can't fake the fact that you don't know this person, but what you definitely can do is kind of prove that relevance and, and importance to them early on. And that's one of the first things guys that you're really going to make sure you, you do well. Um, and different industries, different conversations, different different things are going on. So it's really unique to each company. Um, but that's what you need to think about is how can you how can you tie in what you're trying to talk about with what matters to that person? Everybody's tuned. I heard somebody present one time and they said everybody's tuned into WII FM. What's in it for me? Um, and and that's what they're they don't even know. That's what their subconscious is doing all the time. And so if they see this and they see bold, they're like, no, I don't expect anything good to come from bold text in an email. And they just move on. Right. They're, they don't even really know that they're doing that. They just keep going. Um, so those are the types of ways to think. It's like, hey, if I were writing an, an email to Spencer, it's not going to have bullet points in it unless I know he's anticipating bullet points. Right. And if I'm going to send him a headline or a subject line, chances are it's going to be short and brief. And and because like we know each other. So I'm not going to fluff Spencer up and try and get him riled up with an email. Right. Like we, we have that rapport. So if somebody does that in my inbox, I know that it's not somebody I know because that's not how we communicate. Now, maybe your communication in your industry, like maybe you're in the boxing space and everything's more intense and more aggressive. And like it's just entertainment sports is a little more amped up then that may be more correlated for you. Um, but you got to really play within your field and talk that language and not just not just kind of come out of, out of context. And, and I'm just looking at a couple of things that are in the chat too. Like, you know, first off, you know, as far as bullet points, they add to readability. Is there ever a time, if you do have a bunch of things that you need to say, yes. But again, the whole goal is that you should be trying to have multiple messages and not one that's getting the entire story there. Because again, it dilutes. Like if you say like, hey, we're great at price, efficiency, you know, speed to market, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, that shouldn't all be in one anyways. But the few times you need to, I mean, I get it. You have to use that. At the same time, I wouldn't even necessarily use a bullet point. Use something a little bit less formatted. looks a little bit more informal. Yeah. Gives you a better chance to get read. Um, a question in terms of like staying away from bolded words, um, statements. Uh, bolded words is just something that it's been so overdone in promotional in, uh, emails and then of course cold emails that at this point it just quickly when people see it the first thing they think is this is a you know this is something that I don't know that person and think about it this way you know you all have internal conversations whether it's emails from other colleagues from you know from uh, your boss etc how often do you see bold in there how often do you see bold from uh, just, you know, if you guys are having emails to people, you know, like it just doesn't happen very often. So it's just right away. You sort of think, hey, this is from someone I don't know. And you lose that chance for them to continue reading the rest of that email. And I saw another question just in terms of, of recording. Um, we are recording this, so we'll definitely send this out to everybody uh, afterwards as well. All right. So let's move on to the next one. How Audi checks driver's license. Okay. Audi uses driver license checks to stop joy rides and provide a digital first combustor first customer experience built by the former Airbnb trust and safety leads Burbex powers these ID checks with super low friction a bunch of checkpoints and who do you rely on for improving the digital customer experience at company okay so you know we talked about bullet points and bolts we're not going to go into that again but here's the big thing right you go into this like here's what Audi does I still am not really sure of like what this relates to of me mm -hmm. and how this is affecting me or why I should be doing what Audi's doing here, right? It's just, you're just saying this is what they do, right? So it checks to stop joyriding. I'm trying to, again, without knowing too much about the business, stop joyriding uh, and provide a digital first customer experience built by the former blah, blah, blah. Um, trust and safety leads, Burbex powers these ID checks. Okay, so it's about ID checking again, right? But it reduce auto theft, securely handle. Okay, I sell more cars with faster financing. Winston, I see your comment. We'll address that there in just a minute. So what are we specifically, like, what is the, the product or the, like, I know Burbex, but like, what is, help me understand guys, just so I can give a little, get a little more clarity and give like an, a, a better answer here of, of how to construct this. What is the product here? Yeah. If you guys want to chime in in the comments and just kind of give us a quick overview. So it's biometric um, scan of user's face, but I guess I want to understand like in this use case, like how are you using it with Audi? Like what is it? people selling cars, renting car. I'm just uh, e-commerce auto dealers by driver's license checks, automated identity, identity verification, shift Carvana age verification, car gurus, CarMax. Those are people using this stuff. It deters fraud at Audi. Um, so I guess my main question is who are we reaching out to with this email? 
who is the yeah who's the ideal prospect that's going to receive yeah. this somebody in operations and where where in operations product manager okay yeah like who is this a pain point for yeah like a cto okay So like they're keenly aware of these of these pains and they're trying to prevent these damages. And if that's something that's top of mind, then you'll get away with coming into a cold email that's a little bit more like to Spencer and I, this this feels convoluted because we don't know wh what why Audi is relevant to us. Um, but if you're in this space and you see this message, it may click a lot faster than it does for us. But that said, never overestimate human intelligence. Most people are thinking at like a grade three level at best at all given times. So um, the simpler you can make something, uh, the more likely it is to be, to be received. And uh, I can't remember where I heard this stat, but the more... Uh, it was told to me that the more formal an email gets or the more professional, uh, the, the lower its receptive rate goes. So the lower your replies are going to be. Um, so the more casual, kind of more like coming alongside somebody that you already have rapport with and relationship with, that type of language, um, even in this stuff where, where maybe like this is more compliance and a little bit more nitty gritty, um, will still be better received because it's people to people, even if it's B2B. Yeah, and I'm just trying to figure out like wh what they're actually selling to like in this use case, you know, so for example, are we talking about we're selling to Audi to, you know, their lots so that their employees are not taking like joy rides and they have to have identity, you know, verification to start the car. I, I guess I'm not 100% sure. So I don't want to rewrite that email. I'm definitely you know happy to have that conversation later, but I don't want to rewrite an email without having that full context. But again, same sort of points that we mentioned that last one you want to try to avoid avoid here. Um, all right, we're going to move on one platform, one platform from application to close. Creating a seamless user experience requires single journey native to one tool. Burbex powers blend to verify borrowers with instant ID checks. Do you think document based identity verification sh today should be part of the mortgage tech stack? Okay, so I know same proc we're now talking to, you know, it sounds like, is it, is it the mortgage lenders? I'm not I'm not sure. But that being said, again, we want to talk about why that's an issue, right? Less about like, so we're talking about here, the story is one platform from application to close. So I don't know that that's going to be intriguing enough and it's kind of too generic as far as a subject. But that being said, if that's our story, we want to find a way to really convey that, right? And again, I'm going to make some things up because I don't know those issues, you know, without getting deeper with, with you guys, but we want to dig into those specific issues, right? And so, um, for example, one platform probably creating a seamless user experience, you know. And, and obviously you'd be a little bit more specific here, but I just, I don't know the space well enough right now, but. You know, same as X, Y, Z, right? Um, and in fact, you know, I can already see what I don't like here. Do you have issues? I would say, do you have this issue, right? And I don't know what this issue is, in, in, you know, until we, I, I would dig in with you guys, but do you have this specific issue, right? What is that? you want to help them visualize, oh man, you know what? That is an issue, right? You know, just to give you an example, a lot of times people don't even know they have issues. You know, 400 years ago, I'm pretty sure nobody said, man, I wish I had air conditioning. They knew they hot, they knew they were hot, but they just thought this is how life is. This is what, this is, this is what life is. It's hot, right? Same thing here. They may not realize that having these multiple applications is an issue. It, I guess it gets the job done or it's just, it's what it is. Right. So we want to make sure we make it really clear about what that issue is to them, especially if the story that we're telling is about how one platform solves this. And again, since I know guys, this is still, you know, Burbex, et cetera, need a little more information to, to really recraft this campaign, but at least want to give you guys an idea of sort of how you'd start to form that. Um, Matt, chime in with any additional thoughts? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Um, I, I want to go back because I told Winston we would answer his question here and he asked, um, where do you stand on asterisk parenthesis and any other special characters and subject lines? And like the first thought that I have um, is how would you use those in context of sending an email to somebody that you've already established a 
connection with. So be it a client or a fulfillment partner in your business, like if you are going to use those in a natural con context, then go for it. But if you're not, then they don't have any place in your, in your cold outreach either, because it just is one more thing to set you apart from a natural, um, you know, relationship building process. Really guys, what you're doing with these cold emails is building relationships and you're building them. Like what you guys are doing really well is, is being aware of why your companies exist. And that's, that's obviously critical to your roles is to understand why you are doing what you're doing. But when you're building a relationship, you can't come in and say like, Hey, I'm looking for a house and a dog and a truck and a great insurance for all three of those. And I would just love to have a wife who is, who's blonde and, and, and doesn't do anything all day. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you went and sat down on a hot date and said that, like that date is over. You know what I mean? So you need to come into this. And, and as he used the dating analogy earlier, like you're just trying to build that kind of rapport by saying, Hey, we're aligned. We do have this mutual kind of direction I want to go in, which is dating um, or which is trying out our product. But it's really about making an established connection first, because if, if you don't get that, then you don't have their trust and without trust, they're not spending any money anyway. Um, so even if they believe in your product, but they don't trust you, they're not going to swipe their credit cards. Um, so that's something really important to think about. It's like that trust is critical from the start to finish. When's the last time you spent money with somebody you didn't trust, right? Like probably never, uh, maybe at a flea market one time. And like you spent five bucks cash. Like, <laughs> so you got to really try and keep it, keep it tangible that cold email is just one more channel to build relationships with. And if you forget that, then you kind of fall into the sales engine really, really aggressively. And it comes through in text pretty, pretty abrasively in most cases. And I just also looked at a couple of other like, you know, comments here. So one was putting like uh, quotes or asterisk, like before Bob Smith thought I should reach out, quick chat, uh, quick chat with XYZ. No, I mean, I don't think you want quotes or anything else there. Like, I'm, I don't know that it will hurt it, but I just don't think it will help it. I just, if you already right. are saying like, here's a specific person that you know that said we should connect, that should be enough. Um, or even quick chat with XYZ, it just, it doesn't do anything. If I saw quotes, I would just be like, that's a little odd. Not, yeah. but it doesn't really change anything. Um, also looking in terms of like, somebody mentioned uh, car rentals is one of our verticals. So as far as the one going back with, with Audi, so like, again, I'm, I might be wrong, not knowing your space well enough, just off of, you know, this quick message, but that being said, if the issue is, you know, what is the loss of having one car get off your lot because of identity fraud? That's what we should be highlighting. You know, Hey, have you ever had an issue with identity fraud? You know, right. if you have, um, how have you dealt with it? You know, start a dialogue that way. Right. Just be really like, you know, upfront and and they're going to look at your website if they have interest or they're going to answer your question. And then that starts that dialogue. Um, can you explain further on how to create trust in the email? So, I mean, as far as, you know, to be able to create trust in the email is not making the person uncomfortable by asking for, you know, number one, just too big of a commitment right out of the gate. Number two, and I know there's people that think differently based on this about deliverability and those things that don't put any links, et cetera. I think it's really key to have a link to your LinkedIn, your website, um, and some basic information there, because to me, that builds trust. We live in a digital world at this point, and if I can't see that you're a real person, and of course, that if I go to your LinkedIn, there's not an image, et cetera, uh, you've lost my trust at that point. Right. Um, so it's less about gaining trust. It's more about at this step, these stages, not losing trust right? And losing that credibility. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, when you first meet anybody, there's, there's not really a level of trust, but it doesn't mean you're not interested in talking if, if there's some perceived value there from the beginning. And so it's kind of just about like dangling that carrot and saying like, Hey, I've got something interesting here for us um, and not losing their trust in the process. And um, I've had, I've had prospects come back. And again, like I've seen over 3 million cold emails go out. Um, some of one guy replied one day and he said, you know, you don't have a, a website linked below. You don't have a footer on your web page. Like they just started calling out stuff. And I'm like, nobody's thinking about this, dude. But at the same time, I guess like subconsciously we all are. And this guy was hyper fixated on it, which, you know, it's only happened one time. So obviously it was an anomaly. Um, but really he called out what our subconscious is doing. So if there's no subject and or, or there's, if there's no subject or there's no anything that kind of standardizes the approach, um, then it kind of drifts further from what you know. And the less you know about something, generally, the more fear 
people have around stuff and fear is the opposite of trust and trust is where the money is. So if you're creating confusion or things that don't associate well with what these people are doing in their day to day, you're opening fear up as the emotion that they feel if they were to commit to an action within your cold email and they are going to move from that so fast. It doesn't matter if you send five more emails, right? Like they just want to get away from that thing because they haven't even got to the fear point. They just got uncomfortable and they know their their brain over the millions of years of evolution was like, absolutely not. This is not for me. I'm out of here. Um, so you're kind of just trying to not screw it up in the beginning. Exactly. And, um, you know, I think guys, we're down to the last email actually. So uh, if anybody has any other emails they want to add, definitely give another minute or two for that. And then also happy to answer just any generalized questions um, as well in terms of, you know, emails, uh, whether it's around the deliverability, whether it's around the messaging, um, Matt and I both happy to. I'm going to add something Spencer on links too. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with Spencer guys on, on the link stuff. Um, I think links are, are very powerful and it's important to have one call to action and one theme. So you don't want to be directing people in your email to uh, a booking link but also a link to click for social proof and also something else. Like you kind of want to try and keep it as pointed as you can, but here's the wrong time, in my opinion, um, to, to use links. Don't go link heavy. If you are brand new to cold email, because if you're sending from a brand new account, it's one more thing that tells the servers out there, the automated systems that, Hey, here are characteristics that we have identified with spam but it's like saying we've identified cars with, with people dying. Like it's not going to write you off obviously, but people do get in car accidents. So it pushes you one more flag towards them, putting an eye on you and saying, Hey, this guy also had six bounced emails and his accounts only been active for a week. And he sent out 200 more and nobody opened them. Like this, this kind of starts to seem odd, right? Like most people get their emails opened if they're emailing people they know. Um, so what does that, what, what do you do with that information? I mean, Hey, if you've already got your open rates down, you're getting reply rates, go to link heaven. Um, but otherwise you should just ramp up until you get that kind of established account, if nothing else, and ideally established copy that you can start to kind of move that stuff into as you move it into hundreds and thousands of emails per month. Um, you know, that, that's how you scale those things. Um, again, you know, my word is, is not, um, the end all be all this stuff changes every day. And that's the reason these calls and being on lives like this are so important um, because unless you're in it every day, it's such an ever changing space that it's impossible to stay up on top of. So it's really good to kind of get in front of people um, and have conversations that are open like this to hear what is and isn't working. All right. Let's see if there's any, what's the age factor domain or actual email at domain. So, I mean, as far as the age of, of a, of an email domain, you know, as Matt was kind of mentioning, there's not like, if you do this, this, and this, you'll be good. And if you do this, this, and this, you won't be, there's known things that will help with deliverability. And I will say that, you know, usually what we found, but those things are quickly changing that, you know, if you have a domain that's over one year old, one, you know, you're usually in a decent spot, you know, two to five years in much better. But at the same time, we have a lot of people that want to start, you know, and they don't have a secondary domain warmed up. And so you go with what you have, but that way, but in those cases, domain age is just part of the equation that speaks to deliverability, you know, in terms of how often you're sending, is your target list, you know, right? Is it, are you getting a high bounce rate? You know, all sorts of things there. Looks like there's another message that was posted in the chat itself. I'll go ahead and put it in here. All right, subject, quick question. It's been around forever. It doesn't work as well as it used to. It can still work. Um, so I've got, you know, different thoughts on it, but the proof is in the pudding. If it works, it works, but um, it's worked in the past. Uh, hello, your investor relationship experience is quite impressive. I'll try to keep this short and sweet to be conscientious of your time. Uh, you clearly have had a very successful career within investor relations, medical devices, and ophthalmology. Your success is capturing the attention of XYZ Investor is very impressive. This may be a long shot, but is in search of Director of Investor Relations at Corporate Communications. In case you've not heard, heard of us, we have commercialized the first and only in, adjustable intro, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read this for everybody. Okay. So we are, and I think, you know, as mentioned in some of the earlier ones, we're giving way too much here. 
forgetting even the fact that if somebody would read all this, it's just too much. It's just information overload. These are yeah. things that like you'd want to go over a lot of them on a call, right? Like, you know, access to the CEO and all like those are like second and third questions. That's not usually going to be the very first thing of do I even want to, you know, talk to this company, right? And so that's number one. Number two, you know, we talked about, of course, you know, fluff that shows me I don't know you. We talked about leverage as far as, you know, our time is as valuable as theirs. Okay. Uh, you clearly, you know, same thing. You clearly have had a very successful career with investor relations. I mean, it's just what value does, I mean, if we already have, you know, and we can show, show that in a second, that we already value them if we're reaching out to them, you know. Now, if we're trying to show that we know what their career, what they've done in their career, okay, maybe. But even then, again, it feels like fluff. And it feels like sort of like just trying to, you know, float my ego, but not in a good way, in an artificial way. Um, your success is capturing the attention of XYZ was impressive. Okay. In search of director. So it looks like you're trying to fill a role. And I'm just going to highlight too, like the, yeah. the success of capturing the attention of, like you're kind of positioning yourself below them again by doing that because then it's like saying i know you're trying to put a compliment in there but that type of compliment puts you below them to say that like that's almost aspirational that they did something whereas if you want to come alongside them as a peer and help them where they're at they have to respect you at that level otherwise the whole relationship even if you get through to a sale is going to be them talking down to you um, or, or looking as if you always are indebted to them um so you know, it, you don't want it to be too impressive because then it's like, it's almost like you're telling them that they're, they're doing things that are so above and beyond you. Whereas if you're in their space, I'm like, I used to be part of an agency that worked in mergers and acquisitions. Um, so it was a space where like the, the clients that I dealt with um, really did have a lot to brag about in most cases. But if I let on even a bit that I was not as confident as they were, or that I was not as, um, you know, in touch with what's going on in their industry, they just write me off like that and almost look for the next guy to talk to. Um, so you just kind of have to sometimes in, in higher stakes, depends on the industry in particular, but you don't want to position yourself too far below those people. And Spencer's got the, the brain gears working here. I'm excited to see what's coming out. Also keywords that are like really high level, um, people will kind of sniff that out as well, like medical devices. That's like a massive industry, right? So chances are if they're in medical devices for ophthalmology, you can name a medical device for ophthalmology that's relevant to them. And that tells them you're part of their industry. Medical devices is part of every medical industry. Um, so yeah, those are little things that, that stood out to me right away. So, you know, this may be a long shot. You know, we're definitely not going to have anything like that. And now we're talking about what we do. We're talking about relocation. Like, you know, again, my, my first date thing, it's like uh, within the first three hours, if we had a good first date, after the first kiss, I'm also talking about, hey, you want to move in? You know, really, really too soon. So... one of the biggest things I've learned the hard way and cold email guys. And it, it may just take learning it the hard way for you to grasp it within your own industry, but is really just realizing that even though that person or that company um, may be perceived even in the public eye um, as something much more successful, much more important than your company um, or who you are, it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they're people and they grew up with Bob down the street who fell off his bike and they're all just people is kind of what I'm trying to get at. And, and if you kind of esteem them as, as being something so much bigger than yourself, it comes through in a way that they don't feel that they can kind of talk and, and work with you in a sales environment. Like most people um, that have had success 
are used to working with other people that are also um, some level of successful. And so there's a comfort level across the board, even though, you know, my company Coldlytics is very small. Spencer's company is much bigger than mine. And I talked to somebody the other day who's got like an eight figure company doing crazy stuff, but because we were all just talking on kind of a peer level about, about common goals, it kind of smoothed the lines, even though we're at different stages of, of success, if you will, in the public eye, it didn't matter um, simply because we kind of were able to just focus on the common ground and that equal objective. So uh, with that ramble, I'll turn it back to Spencer to kind of show you what, uh, what he's got for you. All right. So guys, here's what we did, right? There's an opening right now for director of investor relations and corporate communications at XYZ name. Okay. If that's sort of the space they're in and we're talking about they're an opening, you got my attention. Everybody, it's kind of like when somebody says, this is for sale, you know, when you go somewhere and it doesn't say for sale, everything's for sale. The same thing here is everybody is always has the potential to go to a new job, a new position, even if they're not looking. So they're going to be curious if this fits in their space and it's a high level position. And now instead of like saying like, it's so great that you did this, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what they've done to show that this is why this role is specific to them. We found your resume specifically interesting as the role requires knowledge in investor relations, medical devices, and ophthalmology, which it appears you have all three. So now all of a sudden, we are saying we understand who they are and why it connects it to why this is a really good fit. Would you like to hear a little bit more, a little more about the role? A little bit more, I should put, about the role, right? Not are you open to a conversation, et cetera, right? Again, a little bit too quick. And if they want to hear more about the role, you know what, it's probably going to, the next step is going to be a conversation anyways, but we're not asking for a super commitment right now. And the big thing of also why you don't want to ask for a super commitment, think about it. First off, if you're sending this to that person's place of business where they actually already work, they may feel a little bit, you know, uneasy. And then second off, you know, again, they, a job and moving to a new position is a big thing for somebody, right? And so let's ease in. Let's not say, do you want to like have a serious talk about this or, you know, and the same reason why forgetting how long it was, we don't want to give details about relocation and all that here. We just want to get them to that next step. You know, as far as that goes, you, you might have, you know, different processes, different number of steps, but you might have five steps to get from somebody to, you know, beginning all the way to an appointment, a conversation, a demo. Would you love to skip all, you know, all those steps and go right from one to five? Absolutely. But at the same time, you can't. The client or prospect's going to dictate that. You skip when you can, but you've got to ease in. If that person says, you know what, this is interesting. When can we talk? And that might happen sometimes. Or you get that first response and go right to it from there. Uh, I saw a question to link a PDF or landing page or attach PDF for more info. Um, you don't want to add a, a PDF or any, um, yeah, you don't want to do any attachments anymore. Like that will kill you as far as deliverability. Um, if you really want to lead someone somewhere, you could, you know, put that on the cloud. However, when you think about that call to action, think about what are you going to do with that call to action? Do you really want to lead them somewhere or do you want to get them to a conversation with you? Um, to me, there's two different ways to approach somebody in very different, you know, avenues. One is if you already have, you know, them in your marketing campaigns and you're sending them information, that's great. Let's keep sending them information. Let's get them to different landing pages, et cetera. But here, really, you want to control the process. And, and again, you can't always get that call right off the first email, but the whole goal here is to usually start a dialogue. Um, so most right. of the time, I would say it's not going to be to your advantage to send them off to some information that they could then, if they do get to go to that information, they can strew that in their mind however they might versus you controlling that narrative. And that's one of the biggest things with outbound. You know, you get to funnel them into having that conversation with you to qualify on both sides versus them qualifying themselves. Yeah. One of the biggest um, things that I think misleads people is we're all consumers, but we're not all in the B2B world. And if, if we're in the B2B world now, it's probably been for a limited period of our lives, but we've been consumers our whole lives and we've received direct advertising our entire lives. So what we're used to seeing is companies send out promotions and clickbaity stuff. And it doesn't matter because they're sending out so many millions of it that even if a fraction of a percent bring that coupon into the store, it profits for them, right? Because they're just knocking on so many doors and nobody's there to stop them. So we come into cold email and we send in a cold email and we kind of expect this instant gratification thing because that's what we did with a coupon one time, right? And somebody sent that to me in the mail and it was cold. Like that's kind of what, what goes on in our, our minds initially, at least for me. Um, and so what happens is if, if you look at your sales process, chances are it's not a, a seven day, it's, it's often not even a 30 day process. It's often six plus months 
that people are aware of your company before they actually spend money with you. Um, so when you think about that, if your cold email is coming on trying to just get from, like Spencer said, from step one, jumping all the way to five, you're missing the point that this person is probably still a valid prospect for you and would be interested, but you can't skip those steps. And sometimes asking for a meeting, guys, is too too fast of a step. You have to know your space and look at your average sales cycles. If you're trying to do something with a cold email that happens a month later in your sales cycle normally, but you're trying to ask that out of the first email, that's obviously not gonna roll over very well because your whole company has been built on a different process. You have the data to tell you that doesn't work. So don't overlook the information you already have about your current sales processes that work elsewhere. This is just another channel that you have to apply it to. So even though people can say, hey, look at this template and look at all this stuff, you have to correlate it to, to your own business experience. And if, you, if you're you know, established enough to have that track record to look back and say, Hey, look, we actually have some data we can pull from. It's going to be super helpful to you. And if not, then it is a game of trial and error, but you know, don't, uh, don't put the cart before the horse. And looking at a couple of live questions here, one was, you know, want to ask about a super uh, feature laden product. Where do you draw the line between selling solutions versus capabilities? And a follow-up to that was selling qualitative messages are often viewed as BS features are more substantive. So, so, oh, so here's the thing guys as almost everyone always tells you in the right, you want to sell solutions, not features. Now, if you have a super simple product that has like one specific feature that solves a major problem, sure, go right into that. But most of us, that's not the case. And that being said, you know, when you're talking about, you know, uh, just, you know, giving uh, qualitative messages, their view is BS. Their view is BS if they're fluff versus having substance. By, you know, pinpointing a list of different features doesn't give it that substance. I'll give you an example, right? We're a sales engagement product. And if we list that, like, hey, we can increase your revenue by 50%. That's fluff. Now, if we say, hey, we can increase your revenue because we give you a, a specific view to know when people, for example, from seven months ago are re-engaging with you. Now I've given you a little bit of substance. And I haven't gotten into any feature. I didn't talk about what it was called. I didn't talk about how that feature works. Right. And so, again, you want to talk about how you solve problems for people. And it's not that features are important because what's going to happen if, if you know, someone has interest to in that, then they're going to get on a call. And then whether it's on the second call, third call, fourth call, and whether it's that person or someone else, you know, that's also working with them, maybe in, in more of the sales operations, et cetera, they're going to want to know about the specific feature set. So absolutely. But you're just not getting into it at, right now, because if you can't highlight a, a problem or something that you can do better than they're currently doing or saw or a solution, then there's no reason for them to go into that deeper step. Those steps happen further down the, down the line. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys have ever done any of the old fashioned sales training, like the first time I got sales training was in a furniture sales. It was my first sales job. And they talked about features, advantages, and benefits. And this is ingrained in my mind, FAB features. Advantage. And we were supposed to start with the feature, talk about the advantage and how that benefits them. And I remember slowly realizing that nobody gave a shit about everything I talked about until I got to the benefit. And then the sooner I just moved and like got on the couch and jumped on it and said, see, look, I weigh 150 pounds. When your 13 year old son who weighs 90 pounds jumps on this couch, it's not going to break. That's all they cared about, right? Because the last one they bought from Kmart fell apart. So like <laughs> it's sometimes you just have to kind of put your product to the side and then people will show you, people will ask and say, hey, you know, how is this built or how is how does this work? Um, and then that's when the advantage and the feature become important. Um, um, but it's the stuff that used to work and the stuff that we've been raised and experienced around um, has changed a lot in the online world. There was a question um, in terms of images or GIF embedded in a message. I'm, I'm assuming that's just asking, should you? Um, assuming that's the case, <laughs> everything affects deliverability. Uh, you know, for example, Cliently has built in video messaging. Would I say send a video message to every single cold prospect as the first message or send it for every message in your sequence? Absolutely not because of thumbnail, <laughs> even that, by itself, that image is going to you know lower your deliverability. However, if you feel like there's something there that's going to add a lot of value or help you get a response, absolutely mix it up. Because at the end of the day, every single message should be a slightly different type of value prop or pain or a different tickler to get them engaged. And so, yeah, you know, have those in you know a third or fourth message if you haven't received that response elsewhere. Because even if the deliverability is a little lower on that specific message, if you haven't gotten that response yet, anyways it's okay to try something unique that might get a lower deliverability, but a higher engagement, but just don't flood your messages with them. That's Use right. them yeah. sparingly and, and, and when it makes sense. All right, guys, I think we're a little bit over. This has been a, a great call. Uh, really, you know, enjoyed going over these different, these different campaigns. We should definitely do more of these. 
Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have anything else to add. Um, let's, you know, we can wrap it up, Matt, in, in case you had any other questions um, from, from yours or any other thoughts from your side. No, I'll just say, guys, if, if you need help around the targeting side and trying to figure out how to hone that in, um, I found a lot of, of my optimizations and the campaigns that did the best, even with poor scripts, actually came down to targeting. Um, and if you say the right thing to the wrong person, it doesn't matter. Um, so if you guys look for clarity on that stuff, post it in the Cliently group, post it in the Coldlytics group, um, or just find a way to get hold of either of us, because um, we both got a ton of experience on that. And I love that this was focused on the copy, because most people have zero training on this stuff. So I hope you guys have really benefited from this. Um, but there's many pieces to this and it's a much broader discussion and ideas that this has probably sparked. So don't, don't walk away from this call and move into your next thing. Like take the, take the inertia, the momentum that you're feeling on this call right now and put it into the groups and get productivity out of it. Like, don't just let this go by the wayside. Cause that's the, that's the thing I'm guilty of with webinars is I sit in and then I forget what I watched two weeks later. And I'm like, man, there was something cool that happened. If I'd taken an action right away and stirred conversation, you'll get much more out of these things. So uh, double down, make the most of this. And, and, you know, Spencer's got a killer team that answers like that. So I'm aspiring to that. <laughs> and, and guys, one last thing I will mention is, you know, sparingly, um, you know, one or two a month, uh, you know, I will consult with, with companies directly. So if it's just something where, Hey, we really need to figure out how to get the messaging, right. Or look, we just need to figure out how to get more of our targeted, you know, uh, profiles and getting opportunities in the door, uh, feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to see if there's a fit there to where we can help with, with a few specific companies. And I'm sure Matt's the same way in terms of, of his data as well. So guys, um, let's go ahead and we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll send the recording, uh, you know, probably either tomorrow uh, or, or Monday. And it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. See ya.